Um, I think actually, unusually, for your sake, as well as for my sake, I'm going to start in five minutes because a lot of you were just at my my story time show about castles which is pretty epic and literally lasted until about one minute ago um so you, let's all just go and get a glass of water shall we <laughs> some of you will not have been to the lego story time yet sorry some of you uh, will be maybe watching this afternoon but yeah i'm going to start in five actually the uh, your your my computer is on a piece of turf for lego story time reasons is why I'm just having a little fiddle with the height. There we go, that's better. Ah, yes. Yeah. Splendid. You, can, you get to see a wedding cake in a little Lego tavern in the background. There. <sighs> right. I will go and get some things. Prebuchets. And they seem to work as well. Shall I say an actual time when we should start and then you know? Um, mm. Mm. <laughs> Let's start at eight minutes past eight. want to just have a quick wee or get a drink of water or have a bowl of cereal like I do. people who are just joining me. Excellent. Oh, I do like it when people watch live on YouTube.
Yeah, I've said we'll start at eight minutes past because some of you were at the Lego story time show, which went on for a very long time. We've really only just finished, so, and um, it's not usually that long. So we need to have a bit of a breather, don't we? You do as well, right? Can't just jump into learning after you've been working trebuchet. Time is it? Oh, there we go. It's eight minutes past. Splendid. <coughs> Get the cereal out of my teeth. <laughs> mm. Oh, oh, love my job. Right. Built a working trebuchet. Done a Lego story time about people eating horses. Spoiler. <sighs> Let's learn about animals that live on coral reefs. Yes. <clears throat> still, still not entirely sure. I haven't got a mouthful of cereal. On. <laughs> okay, okay. Do, 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 Hello, Science Alliance. Hello, welcome back. It's lesson four of Coral Reefs. So I am Lara. This is the All Ages Science lesson. Yeah, we've been learning about coral reefs. We've got another three weeks to go. Um, we've talked about where coral reefs are. We've talked, we've made models of coral reefs and talked about the individual bits of a coral reef. We've talked about why coral reefs are being threatened. It's time we talk about the animals that live on coral reefs because that is really why everyone makes a big fuss about coral reefs. It's because they've got so much biodiversity. There are so many different animals that live among coral reefs. So remember when I say coral reef, I mean like the individual little animals, the polyps, um, <clears throat> but they make calcium carbonate skeletons and Obviously polyps die and polyps die and polyps die, so a coral reef is just an enormous pile. Some of them built up over like millions of years of coral skeletons with the living animals on the top. Why do so many different creatures live in coral reefs? Um, kind of for the same reason that fewer humans live in the desert than live near rivers or near hills or mountains or forests. Just a bit more interesting. There are more places to hide. There are, if you're a fish, then there's more places to like have your babies and have your babies be protected. Uh, but if you're a predator fish, then there's like loads of little fish babies to eat. So that's good as well. Um, we will, I didn't want to do food chains because we've already done quite a lot of lessons on food chains in our uh, ecosystems lessons. But I thought we would look at how animals have adapted to live in coral reefs with a kind of eye on who's preying on who. So a prey animal gets eaten or hunted by a, a predator animal, right? First of all, let's look, look at reef fish. Reef fish. Fish that live on coral reefs. So in the coral triangle-y bit, the Pacific Indian Ocean bit of the planet, there's like 5,000 or more different species of coral reef, of reef fish. And um, even over here in the Caribbean that doesn't get talked about as much, there's another, wait, am I getting all confused? Yeah, ca Caribbean, it's over here on my map. Um, and here, that's there's like another 500 different species of fish here. So I'm going to show you some coral reef fish. I want you to tell me what differences do you notice between them? They're, they're really quite obvious and I'd never thought about this. What difference do you notice between the reef fish and the open ocean fish, also called the pelagic, like open ocean, pelagic fish? Uh, if you're not a biologist like me, you might want to just call them fish. Just the standard fish is the grouper and the tuna. And here's some reef fish, the Moorish idol, like gill in it from Finding Nemo, the blue tang, it's obviously dory, masked angelfish, blue striped butterfly fish. What differences do you notice? And if you've um, downloaded the worksheets for my Facebook group, you've got a little box here where you can write your ideas because I don't want it to be necessarily the right answer, just what are your ideas? And also, I didn't say this, bad teacher. Can you say like why as well? Why do you think they have these differences? You've got the time it takes me to go and fix this dripping tap. What differences can you see? And a reason why as well. Just a really quick reason. If you're okay with writing, then maybe write it down. <clears throat> okay, come back up here with me. So I suspect that one of the things that you have noticed straight away is that they are very colourful. They are very colourful. Why would fish 
living on a coral reef, be very colourful, uh, and creature, fish that live in the, in the pelagic area of the ocean, in the open ocean, not be colourful. So you, you might be saying to camouflage themselves against the coral. That is probably not wrong, but it's, it's not the main reason actually. Um, so the reason that, that fish are different colours, it is for camouflage, but it also can be to like attract a mate, you know, like peacocks, very beautifully coloured so that they can look good for other peacocks, um, or to communicate with other animals, like maybe to scare them away. If you live right deep down on the bottom of the ocean, there's no light, is it? There's no point being a beautiful colour to try and attract a mate, because no one can see you. Um, whereas coral reef fish, because because as we've talked about, coral reefs have algae in them, tiny little plant-like things living actually like inside them. And those plant-like things, they use energy from the sun to make sugar, which feeds the coral, see previous lessons. Um, but coral has got to be quite near the surface of the ocean, um, where the sunlight is. So it's it's really bright. So if you're a fish and you live in a coral reef, like, yeah, you can be different colours. You can show everyone your awesome colours because everyone can see you. So it seems, seems obvious, but it took scientists a while to work that out. Um, you also, I don't know how obvious it is from the photo, um, you might have said that they were quite small and you might have noticed that they're quite flat as well. They're, they're kind of pancake shaped. Well, they are pancake shaped. I'm just going to give you the sheet actually, see if you can, I don't, I don't think this is going to be terribly difficult for you. Um, I put this little box just as a kind of summary on your worksheet. If you haven't got the worksheet, you can do this easily with your eyes. But I've got reef fish are, oh, cheapest. Seems like my internet's having an off day. Sorry, I've just been complaining bitterly on YouTube about Facebook being funny, and it turns out it was me all the time. Um, right, first one is I think fairly obviously colourful because it camouflages them against the coral, but they are also colourful because they can kind of afford to be colourful because that's not necessarily how they're getting away from predators. They don't have to camouflage. They can hide in crevices. They're pretty flat, so that helps them sneak into small spaces. And it also, for physics reasons, which we won't go into too much, it helps our colourful, colourful flat. Because, yes, again, if you are a pelagic fish, uh, then to get away from predators, you really just need to swim as fast and as long as you can. So they're built for being able to swim long distances. Someone was using the word on Facebook yesterday. Uh, they're very streamlined, and they are, right? They're built like little torpedoes so they can get away. Whereas a, a reef fish doesn't necessarily be able to swim really fast for a really long time. It just needs to be able to change direction very quickly, right? You can imagine it, can't you? Like, it needs to be able to stop quickly, start quickly, and change direction quickly so it can hide in the little crevices, get away from, from bigger fish. Um, I've learned a couple of words. I don't think any of us are gonna remember them in like, frankly, half an hour's time, but I'm gonna show you them anyway. I kept reading, read the science, that a fish's caudal peduncle helps it to do really fast stops and starts, which is useful for reef fish. Reef fish have a large, Caudal peduncle. I'm going to give you three seconds to just picture a fish. Which bit do you think the caudal peduncle is? <laughs> the caudal, I don't know why I'm finding it such an amusing couple of words. The caudal peduncle. What do you think? It's this bit. There you go. I'm not sure I can see it myself. I mean, I suppose um, it apparently, I think it might actually be bigger on reef fish. I think I've written that down wrong. The tuna is sort of very small. I guess on this fish it is sort of massive. Anyway, I, th I think we'd better move on. Um, did you see my word at the beginning when you were hanging on waiting for me? I asked you, can you get a word for big? Because mini is a word that means small. We use the word mini all the time, or micro, beg your pardon. Micro is a word that we use all the time. Things are microscopic. I asked you for a word that was like that, but meant big. And the answer is macro. We live in a macroscopic world. It's so weird how often we use the word micro and we never use the word macro, but that's what macro means, basically. Just, uh, just micro is very small. Macro is, I guess, sort of normal size for humans to deal with, which is why we don't use the word. But when I was reading about coral reefs, I kept reading that macroalgae was a big problem for coral. So macroalgae, it's like algae, it's not a plant, but it is plant-like. Algae uses energy from the sun to make sugar. Macroalgae, so like big algae, um, it, it competes with the coral, right? It does what, what the algae inside the coral does. It uses the energy from the sun, so it's competing with the coral for space. 
and for nutrients, it can grow even on top of the coral, big problem. And I was like, how have I never heard of this macroalgae? It kind of sounds important. Um, can you guess what macroalgae is? Seaweed. Yep. It's not, we can stop saying seaweed and we can start saying macroalgae. Seaweed is a sort of non-scientific word that basically just means all plants in the sea. But all these pictures that you're looking at here, they are macroalgae, what we think of as seaweed, which is not a plant. Um, it's it's macroalgae. So there you go. So how do you deal with macroalgae? Yeah, you need herbivore fish. And we do have herbivore fish. Here are some damselfish. There's loads of different species. Here's a surgeon fish, otherwise known as Dory's dad. Um, and yeah, herbi herbivorous fish are fish that, that eat the macro algae or, um, and even can scrape it off the coral. And uh, yeah, it really, it really, we, it's very, very important that coral reefs have herbivore fish so that the macro algae, the seaweed, doesn't get out of control and compete with the coral too much. So I also asked you at the beginning, do fish have teeth? What did you say? If you're anything like me, you probably said some of them have teeth. In fact, all fish have teeth. I know you what you're thinking, but a goldfish doesn't have teeth. Yeah, apparently they're just in the back of their throat. It's fish teeth aren't always at the front. If you Google after this lesson, sheep's head fish, you will find really quite arresting pictures of fish that seem to have human teeth. But yeah, all fish have teeth, which leads us uh, nicely into the different kinds of fish that have teeth that can shred algae. And there's another fish that has very, very famous teeth. The parrotfish, here it is. I'll zoom right in, what a beautiful thing. But yeah, look, its teeth are just uh, amazing. They're actually all fused together. So it's got almost this kind of beak. You can see it, see it more easily in this illustration here. Um, parrotfish, it's a bit like sharks. They've got rows of teeth that drop out and there's more teeth waiting behind. And they're all fused together. So parrotfish have got incredibly hard, tough, strong teeth. And it's because they're not just eating the macroalgae, they're actually eating the coral itself. They're, I don't know if you say coralivores or coralivores, but they, they eat the coral, as do quite a few different fish. And the parrotfish's teeth is so strong that it's a fish that eats coral, which is called an excavator, because it doesn't just scrape off some of the living tissue of the coral. It gets right in there and starts eating the coral skeleton as well. So my question to you, which I've asked you on the sheet, if you've got the worksheet, if you haven't, the question is here. When a parrotfish eats coral, this is good revision for what we've been doing. What is the parrotfish actually eating? And choose as many of these as you think. So if a parrotfish chomps down on some coral, skeleton and all, what is it eating? Is it eating soft tissue, fish, calcium carbonate, algae? It could be one of those, it could be all four of those. I'll give you 10 seconds, what do you think? This is a good question because I was getting loads of different answers on Facebook, so it's making people think. You've got to really think back, certainly to the second lesson where we built our model. And also to the last lesson as well. Soft tissue, then, yep, absolutely, well done. That's all the, the layer of cells on the outside and inside the coral, yes, the living bit. Uh, calcium carbonate, yes, because that's what their skeletons are made of. And um, algae as well, yes, they are, there because there's algae inside the living tissue of the coral, right? Very good. So the parrotfish's stomach is full of calcium carbonate and soft tissue and algae. It can digest everything except the calcium carbonate. It can't digest the skeleton of the coral. So its digestive system crushes up the coral into teeny tiny little bits. And um, this is what white sand is. It's parrotfish poo. Yeah, apparently in Hawaii. You go to Hawaii, I've never had the joy of being in Hawaii, but apparently there the sand is very, very white. And it's white sand, because it's actually parrotfish poo. How brilliant is that? I think I'd come across that fact before, but I feel like I, feel like I appreciate it more now. <laughs> yeah, parrotfish can't digest calcium carbonate. Out it comes and forms out beautiful beaches that we get to enjoy. There are some fish um, that eat coral but they're they're much kinder about it they just scrape off the mucus you remember when we made these models we were talking about how really you should sneeze on your model because it's covered in a layer of mucus which traps uh, nutrients and also helps to keep it clean butterfly fish 
like this thing, they just eat the mucus. <laughs> okay, so I think it's time for us to do our activity because we've kind of got onto predators, right? Um, a parrot fish, it definitely gets preyed on by other animals. Other animals eat a parrot fish, but the parrot fish is the predator of the coral. So if you've brought a bowl of water with you, it's so simple this, but I really wanted to think, us to think about this because I'd never thought about it before. I found it very interesting. Get a little piece of scrap paper, just really quite a small piece of scrap paper, and tear it up into little chunks. I don't know how big, that big, right? Like half a centimetre. You just need to have a little, well, actually you need to have two little piles of uh, just te torn up bits of paper. Torn, teared, get some little, little bits of paper in a pile and a bowl of water. That's all you need. Because we're going to talk about the massive advantage that predators on land have over predators in the sea. I had never thought about this. So yeah, if you're hunting something in the ocean, you've got a problem that animals that are hunting creatures on land just do not have. And uh, yeah, and as a physics teacher, this absolutely delighted me. So we'll just do this quick, simple activity to think about it. Right, if you've done enough paper, like I say, you don't need to see that too much, separate them into two piles and one pile just leave on the table and the other pile uh, put into your bowl of water. Like sort of in the middle of the water if you can. And what I want you to do is to stick your finger into the bowl. Try not to touch the paper. It really doesn't matter if you do. But don't touch the paper and just swish your hand around the outside of the bowl and see what happens. Okay, it's not, it's not rocket science, is it? I think you know what's happened. So two piles of paper. One pile, just leave it on the table. One pile, pick it up and sprinkle it into the bowl of water. And kind of keep it in the middle. And then just move your finger around the outside of the bowl and what happens? What is going to happen? The paper starts to move, right? So we're not so interested in the sinking or floating, but you might be finding that it sinks or it floats, but the, the paper is moving a lot. Even if you don't touch the paper with your finger, if you wiggle the water, the paper still moves. Okay, right. Move to your pile of paper on the table and just do the same thing again, please. Just put your finger and swirl it around the outside of the paper and see what happens. <laughs> Is that what you're expecting to happen? Try really, really fast. <laughs> Nothing happens, does it? So my question is, why? Why, when you have paper in water and you swish the paper, does the paper move? Paper? Right. <laughs> so why? Really have a think about that. On Facebook yesterday, someone said, um, because liquid has more particles than gas. Oh, what a brilliant, brilliant, written a better sentence to start the conversation off with. Liquid has more particles than gas. That's not quite right, but the thinking is brilliant and the thinking is correct. So liquid, the particles in liquid are closer together, right? The particles in liquid are much, much closer together. Gas particles are further apart. So we're talking about density. Particles in a liquid are closer together, so you would say that liquid's more dense. And air, the particles are further apart, so you'd say that the air is less dense. And just like how if I apply a force to this whiteboard, it doesn't go anywhere. But if I applied a massive force, then I could get that whiteboard to like smash apart and move. Um, the air particles are kind of bumping against the paper, but there's not enough air particles. There's not enough force to get the paper to move. Whereas in the water, there's more water particles. So they are all having like applying more of a force overall to the bits of paper. So it is moving. How does this apply to predators in the ocean? Well, I'd never thought about the fact that if a shark is chasing a fish, then the density of the water is much more similar to the density of the animals than it is on land. So a lion hunting an antelope just, just runs through the air, right? And catches the antelope, no problem. But if you're a predator in the ocean, if you see, a, even if it's something that isn't gonna move away from you, let's say it's just like a jellyfish, it's floating, it hasn't seen you. If you're a predator in the ocean and you move towards your predator, then just physics, nothing to do with the cunning of the prey is gonna make it go, <laughs> like that. Obviously, if you push in water, the thing you are moving towards you, 
towards just sort of move slightly away from you. So that was a long way of saying, because I'm a physics teacher and I love it. Predators in the ocean have had to come up with even more ingenious tricks than predators on land have got because they're, they're fighting this, this effect that land animals aren't fighting. So let's talk a little bit about camouflage. Here's a picture because it's just cute. Look at this, a bit of fear. This is a moray eel beautifully demonstrating how a predator can camouflage itself. It's just, look at its little face. Uh, because obviously camouflage is very useful for stopping being eaten, but it's also useful for being able to sneak up on stuff. Here's a classic, a master of camouflage, the cuttlefish. I'm so grateful to Nick Hobgood for putting this on uh, Wikimedia Commons. There weren't many photos. But here, here is a cuttlefish. You can see it. <laughs> and then a few seconds later... <laughs> So cuttlefish are cephalopods, same family as like your octopus and your, your squid and all that. Um, they've got chromophores, they've got cells that mean that they can change colour. It's a, such a well-known thing that is not true. Chameleons do not change colour when they with their environment. Chameleons can change colour, but it's just because of what mood they're in. Um, whereas cuttlefish, like octopuses, they can change colour to match their surroundings. Same with seahorses as well, we just learned about this. So they've got these cells called chromophores, which you can kind of imagine as being like tiny little balloons that are all different colours. So if the cuttlefish is against a yellow background, all its yellow chromophore cells get kind of blown up so it goes yellow, right? And if you wanted to go orange, it'd blow up the yellow and the red ones. I'm simplifying, but you get what I mean. Um, the cuttlefish is particularly incredible because it's also, if you look at your arm, you've got them, these little kind of bumps on your arm, these cells called uh, papillae. It can change, it can change those as well. Like they can kind of change shape, go up and down. So the cuttlefish can even change its texture, not just its color, to really blend in with the surroundings. So it uses it to not, uses these skills to not get eaten, but also it, it just kind of skulks like at the coral reef from the bottom of the ocean and then uh, when prey swims past, uh, leaps up and surprises them. Here is another horrifying example of a creature that uses uh, camouflage. The stonefish. I mean, I had, to, I had to get this picture to show you that it, it is a... If I'd just shown you that photo, you'd be like... Uh. The stonefish is the most um, toxic... I think, what's that word beginning with P? But not the poison one, venomous. It's the most venomous fish in the ocean. It's got spines. If something disturbs a stonefish, it doesn't even bother to swim away. It just goes <laughs> and ejects venom into its prey. Um, so yeah, again, lurks on the bottom, rises up. What's happening here? This is my favorite kind of, I think you would call it a predator. What's happening in this photo? We've got a, a kind of, almost sort of slug shaped, quite small little fish that's purple and yellow. And then we've got a big spotty fish. What's happening there? Anybody know? Anyone make it up if you don't know? This is a cleaner fish. The, the little one is a cleaner fish and it is cleaning, in this case, a white spotted puffer. Ah, oh, I've been reading all about cleaner fish and I love them. So cleaner fish, they're very small. They've got this stripe on them which says, I am a cleaner fish, and they hang out together at cleaning stations, that's what they are called, in coral reefs. And big fish have learned that when they've got parasites and creatures living on them, it's very uncomfortable, it's not good. The big fish come to the cleaning station, and the cleaning fish, like they've got this stripe on, I'm a cleaner fish. And they do a little dance, I'm a cleaner fish, come to my cleaning station. And when the big fish comes along, the cleaner fish eat the parasites and the tiny little creatures off the big fish. It's another symbiotic relationship. The cleaner fish is getting a meal and the white spotted puffer or whatever it is, is, uh, is getting cleaned. So I, I love cleaner fish. I knew about them. I was happy with them. I didn't know about the blue striped fang blenny. The blue striped fang blenny is not a cleaner fish, but it has a stripe. And over time, I don't know if it's learned, it has evolved to hang out with the cleaner fish at cleaning stations and do a little dance with the cleaner fish at the cleaning stations. But when a big fish comes along, the blue striped fang blenny has no interest in cleaning that big fish, but it swims over to it, it just bites it, just takes big chunks out of far bigger fish that it really shouldn't be messing with because it has tricked them into thinking there's a cleaner fish. Here's a picture of one. It doesn't look that similar. So here's a blue streak cleaner wrasse, which looks like it's in trouble, but it's actually just cleaning a moray eel here. 
And this is a blue stripe fang blade, but you can see it has got the all important advertising stripe. So this fish is not a cleaner fish. It is what we call a mimic. It is mimicking the blue streak cleaner bath, bath. And, and mimicking is a big, uh, a big thing if you want to get like an easy meal in the ocean. So what I want you to do, this is YouTube, so you, you might want to, uh, you, you, you might want to do it later actually. On Facebook, I was giving them two minutes to do this. Um, since it's YouTube, and most of you are watching on catch up, you could pause and do this on catch up. That I get um, as an adult all the time. Um, because that's what they're doing, isn't it, really? The blue striped fang blenny is scamming the customer, the clients. Um, so I've got you here a message from Morrison's, like a real message from Morrison saying, um, we are aware of a number of spam emails, text messages and social media posts from people posing as Morrison's, but it's not really them. If you receive a fraudulent message, please don't click any links. We'll never ask for your bank details. I put this one in because it's a phishing scam. <laughs> yeah, fish. Um, again, it's just from a bank saying, beware of fake links. We will never send you a link to our website in a text message. So please don't click the text message. I would like you to design a scam warning that the cleaner RAS can send out to the fish on the reef, warning them about the fang plenty. And I've said, try and make it eye catching if you can. Like get the important information down, but don't use too many words that, you know, the, the clients might be on their way to work. They've just got to quickly receive your message and think, all right, I better keep my eye out for a fish that is mimicking a cleaner fish. But it's not really a cleaner fish. But I think I will move on and you could do that in your own time. Or if you're watching this on catch up, then you can pause the screen and do it now. Um, I think we will just hope that YouTube lasts and I'll give you just these three little questions that I've got for the end of the lesson. Oh, very quickly, because we haven't talked about the apex predator, uh, that's the shark, isn't it? Obviously, sharks are in nearly every coral reef and uh, the, they're the apex predator. The tiger shark is a classic one. It's got uh, nerves down the side of its body that can detect even very tiny vibrations in the water. The most interesting thing I found out about sharks as predators on coral reefs is that in Australia, there's two coral reefs that are almost the same, except one of them is protected and the other one, sharks have been hunted for decades for shark fin soup. It's just awful, it's awful. But anyway, scientists got to study fish in a coral reef that had sharks and studied the same species of fish in a coral reef that did not have sharks. And they found out two differences, like the, the fish's body, two important differences that had happened to the fish's body when the sharks weren't there. What do you reckon? How would a fish's body change if you suddenly took all the sharks away from the environment? Two, two like, big changes. Go on, see if you can name them. Five seconds. Which bits of the fish's body? Why? What, what, what bits of its body does a fish need to protect itself from sharks? The tails of the fish that didn't have any sharks around were about 40% smaller because they just weren't, presumably they, they just didn't need to evolve to have big tails to swim away quickly from sharks because there were no sharks there. Um, and the other thing was their eyes had got nearly 50% smaller because again, like presumably they're using their eyes to look out for predators, so predators aren't there. So I just thought it was so interesting how, you know, we would obviously in that situation, humans would be very worried and upset about the sharks and protecting the sharks, but you wouldn't necessarily think about the enormous impact that not having any sharks there would have on other creatures. So it's just, coral reefs are incredibly, you hear about them being delicate ecosystems. Everything is very finely balanced. You take one thing away, you're gonna cause very big problems for everything else. Okay. Three summary questions then. Some of these are based on IGCSE uh, questions if you're thinking about doing marine biology. Have a look at these and then we'll finish. What is the scientifically correct term for seaweed? Oh, can you remember this? What is the scientifically correct term for seaweed? Seaweed, just a sort of blanket non-science word that just sort of means all, all the plants in the ocean. The answer is macroalgae. Well done if you remembered macroalgae. Question two, name one adaption the parrotfish has that means it can bite hard pieces of coral skeleton. Name one adaption the parrotfish has, one way that the parrotfish's body has like evolved and changed, that means it can bite hard pieces of coral skeleton. The answer is, one mark in your marine biology, I used to see, um, hard teeth. It's got very hard, I would accept tough teeth, strong teeth, that'd be fine. And finally, Name one adaption reef fish have that enables them to fit 
into small cracks in the reef. Name one adaption, reef, really struggling to say reef fish. Reef fish have that enables them to fit into small cracks in the reef. The answer is, they are quite flat, pancake shaped, if you will. So well done if you got all those. Okay, you know, thank you so much for coming. Thank you, YouTube, for sticking with us. I think I'd better go and clear some more memory space on my phone or something. Um, yep, that is the end of this week's coral reef lesson. We've still got three more. I'm, I've got to fit a lot into them. I really want to do a lesson on um, fossilised coral. And I want to do a lesson on um, acidity. I think I might ask you to bring eggshells to next lessons. Just a little warning if you're watching now in time for next week. Um, but yes, other than that, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, I'm gonna go. If you want to support me, you totally can. Literally none of this would be able to happen if people were not paying my wages. So I am eternally grateful because I don't want to get a teaching job or something. <laughs> so you can go to my um, about section actually and there's a link there to this website called Coffee, uh, where you can support me with five pounds a month if you would like to and you can. Very much appreciated. If you can't do that then all the liking as well is, and the subscribing is, is very much appreciated as well. 23 comments! Oh no! Oh, we, the, I've gone to my Facebook page because that's where I always have um, a post up saying, if you're watching live, please comment. But I know that why I've got so many comments this time, because it's people going, you've disappeared for ages. You're not there. Ah, what should we do? We are going to check out the Facebook recording. They were just blobs. Oh no, we got a lot of blobs. Oh, thanks. We missed the start and it won't let us join now. It keeps buffering. Avelia. Yeah, good idea. There's, I think there's at least one version of this on Facebook. Watch the latest version on Facebook. Don't watch the first version. That was also a bit of a disaster. My pet fly is back. No, I didn't notice that. Ugh. Fatter and more colourful. You're back. <laughs> All fish have teeth. I know, I know. I was amazed. Imogen and Ophelia. Oh, I hope you got through this one, Imogen and Ophelia. Sorry about all the stickiness. Hello, Sky and Evie. It's your science day today. Yeah, Mary. Hello. I have, haven't I? I totally froze. Shape and colour, splendid. Hello, Suki and Arza and Eunice and Salah. Hello, Salah and Eunice and Arza and Suki. Happy Science Day. That's Mary. Uh, Edwin and Solomon and Jeremiah. Hello. Oh, good to see you lot. Excellent. Uh, I don't know whether you're all still here. You might have You might have just had to disappear when all the stickiness came. The reef fish are much brighter in the ocean, probably because they need to blend in and camouflage the environment. Blurry reception. Oh, that's annoying. The sunfish goes to a cleaning station. Oh, I did not know that. Sunfish, like the biggest bony fish? Is that right? I, I'm just trying to remember that Octonauts episode. That beautiful, enormous sunfish. Oh, I didn't know that they got cleaned. That's cool. Teeth on fish has grossed us both out. I know. Hello, Bella. Oh, that's a nice picture of you. Oh, hello, Laurie and Flynn. Sat ready. Parrotfish look like they have braces. <laughs> oh, and there's Jaden. Hello, Jaden. I think it's Jaden, unless you're talking to someone. Anyway, Jaden, if you're watching. Jacob, hello. Good to see you. Right, oh, YouTube seems to have sorted itself out, but I'm, I'm not going to tempt fate, I'll get going, because uh, I'm back here on YouTube at two o'clock to do my epic Lego Storytime show about castles and to build a trebuchet. If you want to come back then, you just need a wooden spoon, paper, scissors and cellar tape. Wooden spoon, paper, scissors and cellar tape. I will, I'll see you all soon. Bye!